2019 was such an incredible year that we wanted to take a moment and look back. We've always been clear on our mission, but this year we wanted to be intentional about helping people take their next step. You truly were the church for the unchurched this year. When tornadoes rolled through the area, you immediately gave to aid in relief efforts and continued to donate items and aid and cleanup. You fed victims and first responders. Your giving didn't stop there. These past several weeks, you provided Christmas to over 200 kids that otherwise would have gone without. You gave food to those in need. Your giving went around the world with over a million dollars being given to missions. Closer to home, you also gave so that we could do a much needed makeover to our facilities to make them more inviting. Speaking of inviting, you did that too. You invited your friends, neighbors, and coworkers so they could hear about the love of God. We asked you to invite them to Easter and had over 20,000 people worship with us in attendance and watching live online. They saw blessings rain down with Elijah. You also invited them to find their purpose. This all led to another incredible year with 1,185 salvations and 536 baptisms. We celebrate each and every one. With all the people you invited, we needed a starting point for them to learn about the church, provide clarity in how to take their next steps. We started life groups to help them find community. They grew in their walk through Cascade U and you set a record for people wanting to strengthen their marriages at the marriage getaway, only for that record to already be broken by this year's event. You understand that all of these things wouldn't have been possible without your willingness to serve. We couldn't begin to calculate the thousands of hours you have all given in the last year to be part of Team Cascade, but we thank you. It was all done to continue to be the church for the unchurched and share the love of God all over the world. Some were the events at the park that made people feel welcome or taking that love to the community through Love Works, or fellowshipping with them through our nursing home ministry, or seeing lives changed through the prison ministry. This love continues to spread with our original worship music streaming over 70,000 times and our webcast reaching over 13,000 people in 20 countries on average every week. We can't thank you enough. When you give of your time, tithes, and offerings, awesome things happen, and we can't wait to see what's next. That is incredible. Um, I'm so proud of you. They showed me that video in the staff meeting and just seeing what all this church, you the church, have done is just absolutely amazing. I believe we are so blessed. And in my humble opinion, I believe this is the greatest church in all of America. But who am I to say that? But I think you guys are fantastic. And as we start the conversation uh, today, I wanted to just uh, start off with a question. Have you ever wished that people treasured what you treasure? You know what I mean? Like something that you value, that they valued it to. You ever wish people just treasured what you treasured? I'm going to vent to the 11 o'clock crowd for just a sec. We're all family, right? Okay. If not, excuse me. Um, I treasure. I just bought a, a new truck about nine months ago. Treasured it. I don't buy my stuff a lot of new things. I'll, now, I'll spoil my family. But I went out and found this truck, and I'm one of those people, you know, I'm tight with my money, so if I spend it, I'm going to keep it till like, Jesus comes back kind of thing. And so I knew exactly what, what I wanted, and I said, I'm going to go spare no expense. Get the tr- I'm going to get the, the navigation that I want. I'm going to get the exact tr- just every the seats, the, the material, everything that I want. I mean, it's a man's man truck. You can picture me in that, right? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> And, and I bought this truck, and I, I treasured it. I had a new car smell, everything. It was great. Never had that before. And um, here's the problem, though. My kids don't treasure it like I treasure it. <laughs> you too, huh? Yeah. And so the other day, I'm looking in the back of my, my truck, and there's, like, book bags, and there's books. There is a sock, a dirty sock in this brand-new truck. Then to make it worse, I look over, and there's two squished M&Ms. And, yeah, that's what I said when I saw it. In, in the seat with little grease stains from those little devil, I mean, those little angels. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I ain't going to tell you who it is because one day my kids are going to get old enough where they can look at my own sermons and they're going to see that I use them in a lot of illustrations. So I'm not going to tell you who it is, but he, <laughs> his name starts with E-L-I and ends with J-H. We named him after a biblical character, Elijah, to call down fire from heaven. I was ready to call down fire from heaven after seeing that squished in my safe because why? It was something that I treasured. I was taking care of it. I treasured, but he don't treasure it. Don't you wish people treasured what you treasured, right? Like uh, my, my father-in-law, it's got a ton of tools, but he also has eight grandkids. Don't care if you use a tool, just put the tools back. They don't, they don't treasure that. They don't, they don't treasure what he treasured. Are you ladies, wives of the home, you know what you treasure, at least my wife does, a clean home, right? Just, just, we're not asking for much. Just don't throw your clothes everywhere. But that's what happened. Us men and children 
just throw clothes where they, like we're strippers or something. Just clothes everywhere. <laughs> Why we don't treasure when you treasure clean clean a home or right, guys us men our husbands you know what we treasure something way up on our list right up under food and survival. We treasure regular intimacy with our wives. We do. Regular is the key word there. And we're not asking for much. Just on days that start with T. Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <laughs> it's, it's really not that complicated, right? We treasure that, right? How much better could marriages be if we just treasured that together, right? You know what we talked about last week is something that a lot of people treasure. We talked about money. We talked about the wealth, and, and we talked about it because as we start the new year, we saw a stat that 77% of people actually have New Year's resolutions to make their finances better in, in the new year. That's something that we treasure. We talked about it because we looked at the stats last year that uh, most people live paycheck to paycheck. Most people are in, in, in great debt. And so we talk about finances and how to win with money here at Cascade Hills every single January. Here's why. We teach the Bible here at Cascade Hills. The Bible talks more about money than it does about faith and prayer and all the other stuff uh, combined. We talk about it because we know that's the need. A lot of people struggle with, with, with finances. We do not talk about it because we want your money. We don't want your money. I know you've heard the, the deal, the big church, all they want your money. I want to just, you know, cancel that myth. I don't want your money. The church don't want your money. We're good. No one charges you for a parking ticket. No one charges you for the seat you're sitting in. No one charges you to watch those savages you call children downstairs for an hour for free. We don't want your money. You may have went to a church that tried to guilt you into giving. It's not this church. Not going to be me. Not my style, okay? So I'm not guilting you into anything. And if you never give a dime, like I said last week, I still love you. <laughs> We're still friends. If you come back every single week and you never give a dime, that's on you. We're still good friends. We're, that, that's, all I simply want to do is tell you what the Bible says on how we can win with money. And that's what we looked at last week. And it was really a lot of fun last week. We had a message, if you want to check it out, on how to win with money according to the Bible. And it was called, That's What He Says. Jesus, that's what he says on how to win with money. And we looked at an eyewitness who was there who documented this on what Jesus taught us on how to win with money. And you remember Jesus' plan was this, simple plan, but it was to tithe, save, invest, and live on the rest. Remember that? Tithe, save, invest, and live on the rest. And that was the plan that Jesus has. And in the word tithe there, it means tenth. The first 10% of your money belongs to God. It should go to the local church in which you're spiritually fed at. I know you know what save and invest means, but perhaps you're new here today. That's what the tithe is. And the tithe is the way that God can spiritually bless your life. God does not want your money, okay? We looked at that last week. God isn't up in heaven saying, if I could just have Martha, just that $10 from Martha, we could change the world. <laughs> yeah, right. He doesn't need our money, but you know what he wants? He wants our hearts. And he knows the reason we talked about, he talks about money so much in his word is the number one competition for our hearts, for God being number one in our heart is what's in our hands. It's the way we spend our money, isn't it? That's why he talks so much about it. We even looked at last week, Deuteronomy teaches us the purpose of tithing. It says the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to keep God first in your life. That's the whole purpose of tithing. God wants your heart. He wants to be number one in your life. And a lot of successful people that you know or products you may have used, they're actually people that have taken God's plan on how to win with money and they've implemented it in their life. Look at just a few of these. Uh, if you've ever had grape juice, Welch's grape juice, well, the founder was a tither, God's plan. If you've ever had Quaker Oats, I had some this morning. It was great. Donuts would be better, but it was great. If you ever had Colgate, if you brushed your teeth this morning, the founder was a tither, God's plan. If you've ever washed with ivory soap, another tither, God's plan. If you've ever used hind ketchup on your you know, hot dogs or whatever you put ketchup on, he is a tither. $10 billion industry, by the way. It seems that God's plan has worked out good with him. This afternoon, you're going to go to Five Guys or something, and you're going to eat a double bacon cheeseburger like I wish I could have because I'm chewing on head, heads of lettuce right now. Um, with the whole New Year's stuff. This guy was a tither, the, the, the inventor of Kraft Cheese, or founder. LL Cool J. Anybody know LL Cool J? You, look at you, just horrible human beings listen to LL Cool J. I'm kidding with you, man. I used to jam to that all the time. Here's what LL Cool J said. 
Every dime I get, no matter what it is, I give 10% to the church. I'm a lifelong tither. I believe strongly in giving. I'm just giving you some secular examples of people who have tried God's plan and it seemed to work for them. Now, one thing that these people would have in, in uh, common is this. They had habits of, habits of putting God first, and they hopefully, after putting God first, begin to turn their hearts towards God's plan for us winning with money. That's what God wants ultimately. He wants our heart. Solomon, the richest guy in Scripture. Remember, we looked at him last week, more money than Warren Buffett and Bill Gates combined. Here's what he says, and it's interesting, this piece of advice. He says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart. Isn't that interesting that the money guy is saying, above everything else, watch your heart. Watch your heart, for everything flows from it. Here's what I know. It's possible for some things in our life to turn the direction of our heart. God wants our heart. God wants our heart to be in alignment with his heart. That's the ultimate goal. Yeah, we can win with money, but he wants our heart to be aligned with his heart. That's why it's so important we guard it. But there's something in your life that can turn your heart away from and out of alignment from God's heart. It's not your thoughts. You know, we say, well, your thoughts can turn it. Nah, not your words. Nah. See, your words and your thought come from your heart. But your wealth, your money, the way you spend your money can actually turn your heart. And what I want us to look at today is what is it that we treasure? And do we treasure what God treasures? And how we spend our money here on earth, will it last on after this life? Well, are we making a difference with our wealth for the next life? Are we beginning to measure our wealth by God's standards? Are we treasuring what just we treasure? Or are we treasuring what God treasures? So today's going to be a message real short. You're going to love this. Only one point to the message. Isn't that great? Literally just threw out two points 30 minutes ago. So you guys are in for a treat. You should be able to remember it, right? And, and what I want us to look at is this. It's kind of going to be, be a heart cat for some of us to look into our own hearts to see what it is that we really, really treasure. Because we don't know what's in there until, until we look, okay? So for some of us, you may leave here today and say, I feel good. For others, you may say, ugh, I got some work to do. Kind of like the first time that I, I saw that I was going bald. I did not know that I was going bald. No one in my family apparently loved me enough to tell me that you're going bald. And I'm on a trip, and I have a, uh, there's, I'm looking in the mirror. There's a door with a mirror on it. I look back and get a reflection, and I have a spot on my head that a helicopter could land on. <laughs> and my first thought, I was, I was angry. Because there's my family, and they're laughing and giggling and planning their little where we're going to eat, what we're going to do. And I'm like, you don't love me enough to have the decency to tell me, hey, Brent, you're getting a little thin back there. May want to shave up. May want to come up with a new stuff, whatever. And so I didn't know that until I saw it in that reflection in that mirror. So today is going to be a lot like that. Today is going to be a message where we kind of look into our own heart to see what is what we treasure is what God treasures. I'm, I'm laughing. I'm sorry. My mind's going ADD because I thought about my son the other day. This is hilarious. My son, who's on the autism spectrum, he doesn't have a lot of uh, original thoughts. He likes to uh, repeat stuff that he hears. So the other day, this is, I was proud of him, but then it kind of stung a little bit. I'm in there shaving my head, getting ready for church, and he, <laughs> he's sitting over there doing something, eating something. He looks, and he says, that is terrible. And I said, huh? I learned He said, your hair is terrible. I'm like, ah, stung a little bit. <laughs> if he was there years ago, he would have told me, <laughs> wouldn't it, when I first started. But today's message is going to be like that. The goal is simply let's peer into our hearts. Let's look at do we treasure what God treasures, okay? Here's what Jesus says. Jesus is teaching his disciples. Matthew's there, the guy, the eyewitness that wrote this down for us. He's there. People are gathering around, and he begins to tell us what we should and should not treasure. This is Matthew 6, 19. He says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, when he says this, I'm going to be honest, the, the, the disciples are clueless. They're thinking, what is he talking about? Don't lay up for us treasures. Does he remember that we used to have treasure? <laughs> I mean, James and John, we were prominent fishermen. We used to have jobs. And so did Peter and Andrew, fishermen. We had jobs. We could make our own money. We could buy our own stuff. We had treasures, or at least opportunities to buy treasures. And what about the guy Matthew over there? listening so intently as if he's going to write this down one day for us. He's over there. He had more treasures than all of us. I mean, he was a tax collector that was cheating his own people, but yet getting rich and wealthy, and he was doing great. He had more treasures than all of us combined. So when you say don't lay up for yourself treasures, Jesus 
Are you talking to us? Because we don't have any treasures. We don't have any jobs. We left them all to follow you. So I don't, I don't really, really follow you. Now, Jesus would go on. It's it starting to make sense for him. He'd say this. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. Now, you would think they would get it, but this really sent them off, okay? Treasures in heaven? Yeah, okay. As if we were lost the first time, and now treasures in heaven. What is he talking about? We don't have treasures here on earth. We've never been to heaven. We haven't been there yet. How do you lay up treasures in heaven? And here's what Jesus says. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What Jesus says is plainly to him, guys, what dictates the direction of your heart is where your money goes. In our terminology, you know, we'd say, where your money goes, your heart follows. Where your money goes, your heart follows. We would think, no, no, Brent, no. It's wherever my heart is. There my money is. The Bible teaches us where your money goes, your heart follows. So be very, very wise and careful of where we put our money because our heart will soon follow. Now what he's saying here is he's not rebuking people being wealthy. He's not rebuking people having nice stuff. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, the list goes on and on and on. All types of wealthy people in the Bible. But what he's saying is be very, very careful not to pile up so much riches, so much treasure, so much stuff, that without even knowing it, your heart begins to turn. And your heart begins to turn because you begin to spend so much time taking care of your stuff. You begin to spend so much time making sure other people see and enjoy your stuff. You begin to make sure all your stuff is insured. You begin to make sure that your grandkids and their kids and their kids get some of your stuff. And you begin to hold on to your stuff and say, look at my stuff. And your stuff begins to be your treasures. And Jesus says, be very, very careful because it's very sneaky. But if you're not careful, treasures and the way you spend your money can turn your heart in a direction to where your time and your attention and your affection begin to go towards your stuff and not towards me. Your heart follows your treasure. Any of you ever bought a stock that had good potential and you didn't care nothing about it, but you bought it because it could make you money. And then after a while, the moment you buy it, you download the app and you start following it every day. <laughs> and you're like, oh, it's a good day, bad day today. And you start, why? Because your heart follows your treasure. Any of you used to drive like a madman before you had children? You know, some of them, you, 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 didn't, you had no regard for the law. Speed limits meant nothing to you, right? Just getting to where you need to go fast. And then you had a child. And you put him in a little seatbelt and you begin to bungee him in if you're like me, put, Bunching that kid in, duct taping him in, make sure. You're and now you're driving with 10 and 2, like the people told you to, you know, and you're driving the speed limit. You're noticing these things now. And people, you're driving so slow, people are coming by you, giving you the one finger salute. You're number one. You're, you're number one. <laughs> and, and you're driving, why are you driving like that? Because you have what? Treasure in your car, something you value, something you're treasure. And that's what Jesus is saying. He said, There's nothing wrong with stuff, but be very, very careful that your stuff and the way you spend doesn't turn your heart in a different direction and take my place. So here's point number one, and this is it. If you remember this, you got it. Where you store your treasures indicates what you treasure. Where you store your treasure indicates what you treasure. Now, what about the whole heaven thing? Store just treasures in heaven. How do you even do that? Here's how you do it. You do it by not putting all your heart and attention towards possessions, but putting them towards people. Because we may treasure possessions down here, but God treasures people. When we get to heaven, you think we're going to talk about where we traveled, or who we voted for, were we Democrat, Republican, where we did? Nope. You think we're going to talk about the ball games? Nope. You know what we're going to talk about? How you treated your wife, how you treated people that were nothing like you, how you treated people that were in other social circles that you didn't really want to be around or be seen with. How'd you treat them people? You know why? Because God cares nothing about possession and everything about people. God cares about people. That's what he treasures. So when we put our money towards his people, his children, to make differences in their lives, that's when we're storing up treasures in heaven. There's a verse over here that Matthew recorded Jesus uh, saying, and it has everything to do with treasuring people over possession. It's Matthew chapter 25. It says this, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels are with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne. So he's talking about himself there. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
And he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And the disciples are thinking, I had the first part. Son of man, that's him. Your kingdom that we will one day go to, that's heaven. But where I'm confused is when he's saying the people that will make it into heaven, the people that will be in his kingdom, they fed you when you were hungry? Jesus, we've been hanging out with you for a long, long time. You feed others. I don't remember feeding you any time. We've been hanging out with you. When have, when have you been sick and we visited you? When, when were you naked and we clothed you? When were you in prison and we visited you? And if those are the people that are going to be in the kingdom of God, then, guys, we've had a nice ride, but none of us are going to be there. <laughs> I mean, we've hung out with him, but I've never seen them hungry, never seen them in prison. If he's talking about who will be there, we may be missing out. And Jesus clarifies it. He says, Then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? And the disciples are like, oh, great. He's answering our question. Or thirsty and give you something to drink. Or a stranger and show you hospitality. Or naked and give you clothing. When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to the one of the least of these brothers, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. Store up treasures in heaven. What Jesus says is when you treat my people Like I would treat my people, you're storing up treasures in heaven because God cares about people over possession. When you treat people that look nothing like you, like Jesus, when you you treat people that act nothing like Jesus and you treat them well, you're doing the work of Jesus. When you put your time, your talent, your effort, your energy into people, that's when we're storing up treasures in heaven. Now, some of you may be thinking, I feel like the disciples, right? I'm out of love. (laughs) I mean, I, I haven't, you know, visited the sick. I haven't fed the hungry lately. I certainly haven't seen any naked people and clothed them. Pastor, are you telling me to go to a nude beach? I've always wanted to go to one. Do I go to one and pass out towels? No, don't go to one. What are you saying? I haven't done these things. I haven't visited people in prison. My guess is this. If you're a tither and you tithe here so that God's work can be done God's way, You actually have no clue how you're doing this every single day. While you're at work, your money's at work through this place. Let me just share with you just a few things, okay, that your money has done as you tie there. Missionaries, we've got missionaries overseas that are translating the Bible in languages and locations that don't even have the Bible. That's where your money's going. People, right? Through your giving, we've also been able to fund 10,000 missionaries and help with 2 million meals and 7,000 homeowners through disasters and things like that. This is through the cooperative program, which is a place we give to, which is phenomenal. You've also helped um, people in the Middle East for peace and reconciliation. There's a group that we fund that actually, they're Christians that... um, They'll, they'll tell us there'll be 11 of them or 12 of them, and the next letter we get, there may be three left. They're getting beheaded like crazy, but they need food. We fund them. You fund them as they go and share the gospel in dangerous places. Samaritan's Purse and the American Red Cross, all the disaster relief. You guys gave $50,000 to people who lost their homes, people who lost their clothes, people who lost everything. We've done stuff over and over and over. All the local food banks, you've helped to do that. When they get low, they call us to, to refill their banks. The coolest thing is the uh, Love Works program you guys did last year. We're gearing up to do it again in a few weeks. If you missed out, one of the best things we did last year. Man, it was a lot of fun serving the community. But you gave $94,000 to different organizations, 32 different organizations that needed help. 200 book bags to homeless teenagers. Can you imagine that? A homeless teenager... And they don't even have school supplies, but yet you did that. You gave them that. Visited prisons. We visit. We got a big prison ministry. They watch us every week, which is so cool. Get this. We've seen 83 salvations this year in prison. We've been able to have the privilege of baptizing 34 people in prison. Doesn't that ring true when you read that verse and say, You visited me when I was sick. 
You visited me when I was in prison. You clothed me when I was naked. You gave food to me when I was hungry. You've done all that, every single one of you. We've given over a million dollars to missions every single year. That's something you ought to feel real, real good about. And then the best number is like what that video showed earlier. 1,185 salvations and 536 baptisms. That's something we could celebrate. I mean, that's huge. I don't know of a church in America that does that, and we baptize someone every single day of the, of the week, every single day. You guys are doing the work of God. And when I read that this week, I said, that's you. That's Cascade Hills. So where's your treasure? Where's your treasure? Because your treasure dictates where your heart goes. And for many of you, maybe you've been considering tithing and putting God first and winning financially the biblical way. Do it that way because this life will be over one day and your treasures you want to store up are up there. You want to spend your money down here to make a difference in the next life. Because where you store up your treasures really does indicate what you treasure. Now, you've probably heard this verse, whether you grew up in church or not. It's a famous verse. No one can serve two masters. For either you will hate one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You've heard that, haven't you? What Jesus says is, he says, there's no gray area. See, in the first century, you would often have slaves that would have two masters. And they would begin to love one, because of the way they treated it, and hate the other. Jesus says this about money. He said, you either love money or you'll love God. It's one or the other, no gray area. It doesn't mean money is bad. Money is amoral. It can do good things or bad things. But when you love God, he's your source. You put him first as the ruler of your heart, and your heart begins to shift and change and get in alignment with his. Here's what I know. If you're struggling with putting God first in any area of your life, here's something you ought to consider. The area of your life that you don't want God in may be the very indication of the God that you really serve from within. You ever think about that? There's an area of your life, maybe it's your finances or, or another area that you don't want God in. You say, God, you can have every other area but that area. That's the very area that God needs to be in. God, you can have every other area but my marriage. That's the very area that God needs to be in. God, you can have every other area, but I don't want to hear what my husband has to say about where my kids should go to school. You have every other area but that. You have every other area but this forgiveness area here. I don't want to forgive. You have every other area but this. Can I tell you, the area that you're keeping him out of is the area that he needs to be in. That's the very area he needs to be in. What is it in your heart that you treasure? Begin to treasure the things that God treasures because Jesus masterfully wraps up this, this uh, conversation on treasures with this. He says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He's saying with your money, with your time, with your talent, with your possessions, put me first, align your heart with my heart, and when you do, you'll begin to treasure what I treasure, and that's what you were born for. Now, when we talk about kingdoms, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. All of us, I've used this before, all of us run a kingdom, don't we? We have bills to pay, we have kids to take care of, all of us run a kingdom. Your kingdom may be bigger than mine, but all of us run a kingdom. When we run a kingdom for ourselves, the pattern looks like this. Live, that's me, save me, give others. Others is last. When we run something for God's kingdom and we begin to spend our money the way that God tells us to, it actually reverses that. We put others first. Give, save, live. See, God's kingdom is always an others first kingdom. You remember that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his only begotten son. Matthew 20, 28, it says this, The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. When you put God first, you begin to have an others first mentality, run an others first kingdom, and you begin to treasure what God treasures. After looking at this message and creating this stuff for you, one is I was so proud of you, but it got to me thinking, even about the stuff that I treasure, even about that beautiful truck I just bought, trying to save that new car smell. In 50 years, that truck ain't even going to be cool no more. In 50 years, it ain't going to matter. Probably won't even run no more in 50 years. But the boy that smashed the two little M&Ms with the grease spots in the back of my seat, that's the thing that matters. God cares how I treat him. God cares how I train him up to be a, a loving guy and to love God and to treat others. People matter over possessions. But be very, very careful. In life, we're all going to spend money. If you're not careful and aware, 
The way we spend our money can turn our heart either from God or to God. My challenge for you today is to peer into your own heart and say, what is it that I treasure? And how can I get in alignment with what God treasures? Now, as we wrap the thing up, Matthew says probably one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. He says, what is it benefit if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Here's Matthew, at one time the money guy, saying what I've learned is what does it matter if you gain the whole world, get everything you ever want, and you lose your own soul? If you're here today and you don't know Christ, maybe you're checking church out, Christianity for the first time, and, and you're here today, I want to tell you the most important thing you'll ever do is put your faith in Jesus Christ. Has there ever been a day in your life where you've asked God into your life? Do you know for certain? I'm not talking about 50%, I'm pretty good, 80%, and I'm not even talking about 99%. Do you know 100% when you breathe your last breath where you'll spend eternity? And if not, can I tell you, that should be the most terrifying thought in your entire life. Think about it. This life will be over one day. You want to know 100% where you'll spend eternity. And I want to tell you the answer to that is do you know Jesus? Has there ever been a time in your life where you've asked Jesus in your life? Jesus is the only way to God. He's the only way to heaven. How I know that is very simple. It's the gospel. We are sinners, you and I. Our sin separates us from a holy God, okay? Can't have a relationship with sinful mankind. This broke his heart. He loves us so much that he sent his own son to live a sinless life, to die on a cross for our sins. On that cross, holy God poured out his wrath, poured out his judgment, his punishment on his own son, who is perfectly righteous for my sin and for your sin. That should have been us. And he poured out his wrath on his own son. His own son was not a victim. He was a volunteer. He laid down his life and said, I'll stand in their place so they can be made right with you again. He died and went to the grave. And the message of Christianity that separates us from any other religion in the world is that he did not stay dead. He rose from the dead. For over 40 days he hung out, in fact. Over 500 eyewitnesses saw him, hung out with him, listened to his, him teach, ate dinner with him. 500 eyewitnesses. That's about as much as that crowd all down here on the bottom level. Saw him at different times. When he rose from the dead, he proved that he and he alone can offer you salvation. He and he alone can offer you eternal life. If he can do it himself, if God can ri raise him from the dead, then he can also do so with you. He's the only one that can promise us eternal life. Friend, if you've never given your life to God, I want to challenge you today. Don't walk out of these doors. Don't get up out of these red seats and leave here without knowing Christ. Don't do it. I urge you. I beg you. You're here for a reason. The reason you exist is because God loves you. And God wants a relationship with you. Don't miss it. Now's your moment. Now's your opportunity. I want to lead you in a prayer where you can do so right now. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me? Father, thank you so much for your word to us, Lord. I thank you so much that you teach us what we ought to treasure, and that's people. I thank you that you love us and that you gave your only son for us. My prayer at this time is for those who are here today that don't know you, that there's an eerie feeling in their soul that if they died without you, they're unsure of where they'd spend eternity. If that's you and you want Christ in your life and you want to know for certain, simply say this prayer in your heart and you believe on it with all the faith that you have. Are you ready? Say, Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I cannot save myself. I believe that your son Jesus died on a cross for my sins. I believe that your son Jesus rose from the dead. So today by faith, I put my faith in you Today, by faith, I proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Come into my life. Save me. I repent of my sins. Thank you for saving me. And I give you my word in closing. I'll never be ashamed of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you just gave your life to God, you just prayed that prayer. Today is the biggest day of your life. What a big deal that is. The next portion of the service is what's called a public invitation. We're going to play a song, and I'm going to ask you if you prayed that prayer just to simply get out of your chair, come down to one of these couples, and all you got to do is say, I prayed that prayer. I gave my life to God. I would love to personally meet you, get you some information to get you started out right in your Christian journey. 
But for some of you today, you prayed that prayer, but you're thinking there's no way I could, I could do that. What would people think? I could. And there's an internal battle going on, on right now in your spirit. What I should do and what I know that I need to do, but I don't want to. Go ahead and make up your mind. You'll be the first one to come when we play, okay? Everybody Jesus ever called, he called openly and publicly. Matthew, all of them, all of them he called openly. Remember he said, if you deny me in front of men, one day I'll deny you in front of my father. Now's your moment, now's your time. Be serious about the God that saved your soul. Stand with us, you come as we sing. Now's your moment, you come. If you're watching online, there's a number on the screen. I'd love to hear from you. God bless you. All over this room. God loves you. God's got a plan for your life. You can follow him. Some of you are so close. What would you do with it? Now's your moment. Would you follow him? He loves you. Would you follow him? God bless you. People giving their life to God. Now's your moment. If you're watching me from television screen or an iPhone or whatever, call in and let me know. I want to hear from you. Some of you are so close. You're that close. Huh? What would you do with it? The choice is yours. Now's your moment. God's waiting. God's calling. One of the first tithing results from tithing that I got was, well, really Tory because it was like a head knowledge thing. I knew I needed to do it because the Bible says it, my parents say it, the pastor say it, so I did it. Um, and for years I did it on and off and I wasn't as consistent as I should have been. And then there came a time where I just kind of talked to myself and said, all right, you need to be, you need to be serious about this. Not, you know it, but it needs to come from the heart. And I started praying, I said, all right, God, in your timing, bring it whenever, whether it's a day, a week, a month, a year, 10 years, I don't care. But I don't want a girlfriend, I want a spouse. Within about two months, here comes Tori. Um, and it, it's just kind of crazy to see how that consistent obedience brought her in my life. And then I was like, well, shoot, why would I never, why would I stop doing this? Because, you know, I, I'm seeing results already. And then from there, I started praying about a job, you know, put me in a position where I can honor you and serve you. And then boom, I get a call and it's from BP Leadership to, to come work for BP Leadership. And so it's just, it's, it's to a point now, I'm almost scared not to tithe because I've seen the results, I've seen the blessing, I've seen what, what he's done with the little I've given him and I don't know what I would do without it. I was in like a really toxic work environment, I would say. And like, I would call Hunter every day and just crying, like literally. And then I just would continue to be faithful and I prayed about it every day. And I think that strengthened my prayer life too. Um, but I ended up quitting the job, and I literally like didn't have a job. I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting emotional, but I was like jobless for a couple months, and I was literally living off like dog sitting and babysitting, which was great. But I would always tie that and pray about it, and you know, then I recently got a call about this little small boutique in Columbus. And I think it, it answered like It did. It answered a prayer in a time you need it the most. And that's what, you know, a lot of people think that tithing, it's, you get financial rewards from it. And yes, in some aspects you do. And this, you know, she needed a job and she God gave her a job. And, and but I think like the biggest thing that came from that was like through that faithfulness mm -hmm. and like continuing to pray over it and like give, mm -hmm. I think totally strengthened and changed my prayer life. And the Bible says you give 10% of what you have and that's anything. And like for me, I'm a broke college student over here, 21 years old, part-time job. And if I can do it, I just feel like everybody can do it. I don't want to go through life out of his will because when you do this and you're in his will and you see the results, it's, you'd never go back. It's more of a, a, a form of worship than anything else is. It's not just a, oh, it's a check off a list like it was for years for me. Now it's a form of thank you for what you've given me. Now let me give you back what you asked for because he can do so much more with that little bit than I can do with all of it. Hey, thank you for visiting us today. And if this ministry has touched your life in any way, please send us your story to I am at CascadeHills.com. And if you'd like to help support this ministry financially and help us spread the word of Jesus Christ around the world, you can go to CascadeHills.com or our Cascade Hills app and select the Give button. 
We hope you enjoyed the services today. Tune in next week for another great message.